after you have successfully uh, purchased purchased your uh, rooster. <laughs> That's right. I have I have successfully been punched in the cock. <laughs> I've successfully acquired a cock punch, and it was a bit of a cock punch to get the cock punch. Uh, so while we were on the call, you know, I was <clears throat> bouncing back and forth between the main mint page, uh, which I had my wallet connected to and OpenSea, where I was seeing people that were on the allow list flipping their cock punches. And so I was seeing the, the pi- price kind of ratchet up, you know, it, it released at 0.3 ETH and I saw it go from about 1.1 ETH up to 1.7 ETH. And then kind of down from there, back down from there. And so it was interesting because I had this idea, well, it's only 0.3 ETH. I've got one ETH in my wallet, my little sandbox wallet that I use for for stuff. And it's got all kinds of, you know, stuff that I use for for my development and for uh, just, it's got AVAX, it's got Matic, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. And so realizing that one ETH was not enough to get the cock punch. I was like, well, shit, I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta get some ETH back into that wallet. I've got a ledger cold storage wallet, a uh, nice, pretty yellow one that, uh, that has, uh, my ether on it and, uh, you know, a few other things. And I, you know, it, this whole, you know, with the, what happened with FTX and with what was going on with, um, you know, the, the mantra of your keys, your crypto, you know, I took that to heart and moved it all there. And so I expected that I'd be able to get it off of there and back and into my sandbox wallet by simply clicking on transfer. Mm-hmm. Well, after plugging in my ledger device and launching the ledger app, uh, the ledger app needed to update. All right. That's a few minutes. Meanwhile, the cock punch had gone from 1.1 ETH up to 1.3 ETH. Got it updated, got Ledger connected, got the public address I was trying to send to, and input all the information, uh, use the device to do the the clicking as needed. And when I clicked on send, Ledger said, your Ethereum app is not up to date on your Ledger, so this transaction cannot complete. And so... Okay, wait, wait, quick question. You were using the Ledger Live app on your computer to access the Ledger. That's right. I was using the Ledger Live app on Windows to access the Ledger USB device. But the Ledger USB device has its own storage, and it actually has apps that run on it uh, that facilitate the the communication and facilitate the transaction in, in some way. And it was the USB device that needed to be updated. And so I clicked into the USB device and three of these, you have to re-enter your pin code every time using these, this, you know, two button interface. And it's, you know, it's a bit of an ass weapon. And so fast forward another 10 minutes, I'm, uh, I'm on the UI on the ledger windows app, trying to update the USB device app for the Ethereum network. And I was told I don't have enough space on my ledger device to update the Ethereum app. Please Not uninstall enough. some apps from your ledger device. And I look Not and I've only got memory. Yeah. Yeah, out of memory. And I've only got four apps installed. I've got, you know, uh like 10% of the storage is is still available, but that wasn't enough to do the update. And my concern was if I delete an app, that I'm gonna lose that crypto. Yeah. Right. Now I should have known better. I am an engineer, I, I should understand this stuff. The device stores your private key and all your public key info, everything else is derived from your private key. And so deleting an app from your device doesn't delete your ownership of that crypto. It's still on the blockchain. In fact, it doesn't impact it at all. You can, it doesn't even impact the the front end UI. As I later came to find out through going through this, the, the Ledger Live app on Windows still shows your full portfolio of everything that it had associated with it. It's just your yeah. USB key is not outfit and ready to conduct transactions until you put the app on the USB key itself to allow for that collaborative um, execution of transactions, authentication of transactions on the blockchain. I have a quick question. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but the information that's stored on a blockchain is not necessarily, I mean, the the, the, the crypto itself is literally that private key like that is the crypto 
No. And, no. Okay. So then, okay, great. Great that I'm asking you stupid questions mm-hmm. because there are going to be plenty of people out there that are having trouble with this too. <laughs> so the, the, the private key Please help. is yeah. imagine the blockchain is a huge wall of safe deposit boxes. The safe deposit boxes boxes have their content, and they can receive uh, they can receive currency. They can receive things into the box, kind of through the backside by the as if it were a locked mailbox. Maybe that's a better uh, analogy. Is it's like a locked mailbox at uh, at a uh, you know a postal annex or at one of these PO box yeah. locations. And so on the back end, your private security box, your private um, uh, safety deposit box can have things deposited into it. Um, but in order to get anything out of it, you need your key to unlock the box. So the box is persistent. The box, the container and what's in the container is on the blockchain. Your private key is what allows you to open the box and access the contents. And so the ledger device holds the private key that's used to unlock the box, but even by deleting an app, even by you know destroying the key itself and not being able to recover your private key, that box, that container exists on the blockchain. It's just, you need the key, almost like you need a physical key in the real world to access your safe deposit box. You need this digital private key in order to access your blockchain box. And so- okay. But that help? this is where I get a little confused because mm-hmm. um, every cryptocurrency can be sliced and diced and Ethereum and a Bitcoin mm-hmm. can be sliced and diced into small and smaller pieces, right? You can buy 0.00007 of a Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So it's not the coin itself that is the immutable object. Mm-hmm. Then I'm... I'm <laughs> Then your safety, your safety deposit box, where you're holding assets. Mm-hmm. How does one of those boxes get created in the first place? Because mm. there are an infinite number of boxes that could be created. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the box is created upon the first transaction. So when a transaction is executed against a uh, a new private key that hasn't been seen before on the blockchain, that new private key uh, and its transaction of receiving something to the box creates the box. Okay. Then let's uh, let's say I log into a Coinbase account and I buy some Ethereum mm-hmm. for the first time. Let's say I've never purchased Ethereum before through Coinbase. When I do that, a an Ethereum box is going to be created. That's right. Yes. Okay. That's right. But that but I don't have the private keys for that box. Coinbase has the private keys. That's right. I have a login to get access to my account, but it's not the same as having those private keys. That's right. The box. Coinbase okay. has the private keys. So it's almost like you are contracting Coinbase to be your go-between to actually go in in and out of your box on the blockchain on your behalf okay. using something okay. that's called a custodial wallet. They have custody. Yeah. Coinbase has custody of your wallet, which means they have custody of your private key. They hold your safety deposit key. Now, Coinbase has its own security where you have to use your Coinbase account login and they have their own you know, two-factor authentication and means of, of protecting the account that are very common in Web2 with you know, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Uh, but eminently, the access to the box on the blockchain itself and being able to access its contents, the contents of that box, that ownership is in the hands of Coinbase, not in you. And that's where mm-hmm. people have... People have lost a lot in what happened with FTX with this mechanism insofar as not understanding or realizing or realizing, but just um, assuming that FTX was a a reputable company and things wouldn't come to this. uh, Their private keys were held by FTX. And so FTX holds their access to the box 
when FTX stopped withdrawals, what that means is their facilitator, so to speak, their virtual facilitator, the the you know the uh, the the person that is that actually has the keys that's interfacing with your box for you, just kind of put up a do not disturb sign and 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 said I'm not I'm not going to any of your boxes. And so even though you had access to the FTX user interface and portal and all of the uh, associated information about your account, you couldn't access your own funds. You couldn't access your own security box because you didn't have the private key. They did. That's and the way that's, that this. Go ahead. Sorry. That's and that's the the um, the downside of of uh, centralization and centralized authorities that maintain that maintain that ownership. The upside is they they protect it. Like no one's, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss talks about wrench attacks. You know, wrench attacks are when someone threatens an individual with physical violence uh, to give them something. And so, you know, for me, based on my you know, my my crypto holdings, I don't think are enough to warrant this. But <laughs> but based on how I I have it set up, you know, hypothetically, someone could uh, could come and and threaten my life, which I would just I would hand over the keys because there's there's not much. There's not that much in them and it's not worth my life for it. But uh, the advantage to a centralization like FTX is no one's going to go to them with a with a wrench attack to try and get access to your to your funds or they they should have protections to, to better hold it uh, is the the argument for a centralized authority. They know how to store that stuff. They've been you know, they have security, um, security teams, developers, et cetera, et cetera. But the downside is they can restrict your access to your box on the blockchain. And so by not having your own, you know, your own key, uh, you can get locked out. The way that this differs from, say, a physical safety deposit box is that someone, a bank robber, could break into the bank through the main doors, get through the vault, and then take a crowbar to your safety deposit box and open the damn thing up and get access to it. Like that's, it's it's certainly, that's a that's a lot of protection and security that they'd have to get through. Mm -hmm. um, or, or they could do kind of a, you know, I'm going to kill your family to the bank manager and mm -hmm. kind of force them to, you know, unlock everything basically. Yep. Um, in, in this case, so you can, you as a user could technically lose your key to the safety deposit box, and chances are the bank has some sort of master key mechanism and can get into your box, or at the very least, you know, cut it open with a mm -hmm. blowtorch. <laughs> That's right. Um, but that can't be done in crypto. The That's key, right. If the key is lost, it's lost forever, and there's no way to break into the the blockchain safety deposit box. That's right. There's no, there's no back door. There's no blowtorch. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's uh, more strongly protected and more impetus on the user to, to have their key. Now, kind of a, a flip side of that with a safety deposit box, you physically have to go to your bank to extract its contents with the blockchain. Yeah. You can do it from anywhere. And in fact, from any computer. Uh, and, and in fact, I'll go a step further and say this, you know, this hardware key lets me remember a limited amount of information, in this case, like a pin code and a password. And with that, it allows me to um, access the private key that's stored on the device, which is then used to sign transactions or to unlock my, my safety deposit box. But that private key, when it was set up, when I set up this device, the device provided 24 words that were used as the seed phrase to create yeah. that private key. And those 24 words are just as powerful as the device or the key itself. And in fact, you know, if if you're in a in a war-torn country and you need to escape with your with your money, you don't need to run to well to the local safety deposit box to access your funds. If you, you know, write a song, sing a song to yourself of those 24 words and remember those 24 words, you don't need to smuggle anything. You don't all you need is your memory. You get mm -hmm. out of the country into a country that has um, 
has a you know internet connection, the ability to access the the blockchain, and you can access your safety deposit box from anywhere in the world with those twenty four words. And so those are some of the some of the 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 trade offs as far as you've got uh, global availability. Uh, with information that you could commit to a song or commit to memory in 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 times of need. Um, but if you lose those 24 words or forget them or you lose the key itself, it's locked forever. It's yeah. that box, the contents will remain in there. Whatever is in there is going to stay there until someone unlocks it and there's no way to unlock it. There's no back door other than the private key. And this brings me to to Bitcoin. There are a number of Bitcoin safety deposit boxes with vast amounts of wealth in them that people be believe are lost for all time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I read a, a story last year about an individual in the UK who was um, uh, rifling through their local garbage dump to find hard drives, you know, find a hard drive that he had discarded some amount of time before that had some Bitcoin on it because the Bitcoin at that point was worth uh, millions of dollars versus when he had acquired the Bitcoin, it was worth, you know, tens or hundreds of dollars. Pennies. Yeah, for pennies. <laughs> yeah, I saw another article. Someone was paid, it's either a hundred or a thousand, I mean, orders of magnitude, but even call it a hundred Bitcoin to, to bring someone else a pizza. Right. Like I'll pay you a hundred. Yeah. I'll pay you a hundred Bitcoin for a pizza because that was worth like ten bucks at the time. Yeah. And you look now, uh, and sure, yeah. Now what's seventeen thousand one point seven million dollars to deliver a pizza? Yeah. Am I calculating that correctly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of crazy. So I find it ridiculous, and also. <laughs> it really puts into perspective how early cryptocurrency and blockchain adoption really is because I've been at this in a while doing some investing. Now, early on, it was a lot of just dabbling in small projects and, and you know, putting $200 here, $500 there, you know, just that kind of thing, like um, almost I, I, close enough to gambling. It's certainly speculation investing. Mm -hmm. even though I was looking into the projects and the teams and what was the novel thing that they were doing. It wasn't just some, you know, also ran, you know, meme coin or something like that. Um, and yet here I am still not fully grasping the, and, and we're talking in analogies, right? We're not talking in the, in the true coding of all of mm -hmm. this. So it's like, this is a, this is a, just a crazy ass onion of, of um, complexity. Mm -hmm. And every time you peel some back, you get to you know, understand it a little bit more. And yet there are always more and more layers um, to, to, to peel back and, and figure mm -hmm. out. Um, so I, I say that. So if anyone is of course watching this, <laughs> mm -hmm. that if you feel like either you've missed out or um, there's just no way it's too complex and you're never going to figure it out. It's like, well, truly, if you wait to get started till you have everything figure out, figured out, you will never start. Mm -hmm. Whether that's getting into crypto for, for a job or just, you know, figuring out how to invest in or, or, play, or play in the world of NFTs and investing in cryptocurrencies and all that. Um, so it's even for those of us who've been around a while, there are aspects like gaps in my knowledge. Mm hmm now back to your your difficulties with the software because I derailed you a little bit. Um, you were at the point of saying uh, you should have known better. <laughs> yeah, so I should have known better that the private key is all that was needed for the apps, and that I didn't have to fret uninstalling the app. And so I went through a different route. I ended up transferring some funds on Coinbase and getting myself some more Ethereum from Coinbase. Coinbase that I sent to my little sandbox MetaMask wallet. And then I used that to purchase a cock punch for, it was 1.3 something or almost one, about 1. 1.4 ether. Yeah. And uh, so I now have a cock punch. Uh, but I had to go through this, this centralized finance route because my 
currency was locked inside this USB key that required software updates. Now, after getting the cock punch and the smoke had cleared and I was able to kind of focus, okay, let, let me update this device and figure out what's going on. I noticed I had Dogecoin on this, this key and I have a Trezor that has Dogecoin on it also. And so I was like, well, shoot. So I'll just, uh, uh, I'll move the Dogecoin over. I'll transfer it from the ledger to the Trezor. So I went to launch the Trezor app. Trezor app wouldn't launch. Went to the Trezor website to download the, the Trezor app again, maybe to you know update Windows. And uh, the download link is broken. It didn't download anything from Trezor. Whoa. Yeah. And so I noticed Trezor has an online, um, online app where it uses, I'm guessing, HTML5 to to access devices locally. And so you can just use the web page and connect your Trezor. And so using the Trezor web page, uh, uh, web page app, web app, I was able to connect to the USB device, unlock my Trezor, get the public key that I used to, to send the Dogecoin to. I was able to send the Dogecoin off the ledger to the Trezor and uh, remove the Dogecoin app Concurrently, I was doing you know research at the same time. On it was about this time I came to the the realization and and the the support the ledger support article on uh, don't worry about deleting apps off your device. Your private key is what it is, and it's yeah. you're you're fine. Just re- install the apps as you need based on the space you have. And so I was like, all right, fine. So then I went and uninstalled Dogecoin, updated Ether and the Ether app, and now now that's working. But what I learned through that is the um, the Trezor interface is much more fluid, easier to use, uh, and the uh, the process of entering the pin pin code on the Trezor was uh, was a lot smoother actually mm-hmm. than the than the ledger. And so, I haven't done a deep deep dive on functionality, but I'll say I'm a little happier with Trezor than I am with Ledger at the moment. Even though their I've download a, links are, aren't available, and no, I, I got an email actually. Now that you you you, you bring up um, Ledger. It's addressing exactly what you're talking about. Mm. I think I think there's going to be a maybe even a touch screen interface. Oh yeah, I saw that tweet. Yeah, it's a full screen touch screen device. Yeah, th- there's lots, so many things like this in crypto, right? Where where the first to market stuff is useful but not user friendly. Right. Like it's functional but awkward. And so, yeah, I think we're getting to this point now where finally they think the underlying technology is complete enough and now enough people are onboarding into it, especially when companies like Fidelity uh, and the like are giving people access to, to buying cryptocurrencies. Like at yeah. this point, it becomes reasonable to start developing user-friendly tech. Yeah. 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 And I think... For the general public, for for muggles, as Tim would put it, as Tim Ferriss uh-huh. would put it, I think for muggles, the 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 Coinbase or the Fidelity or the you know the the standard finance route is a good way to go. They keep the information secure, they keep it protected, and to the extent that there's responsible legislation and regulation put in place around crypto uh, that regulates the availability of liquid assets and the the um, responsible gambling by banks on what they what they receive um there's a high level of protection there and it's 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 going to be a good fit the the hardware wallet route with your own key and managing your own usb device puts a lot more power in your hands but with great power comes great responsibility like the responsibility to keep apps updated and <laughs> and I don't I don't see that being something that my dad or my mom would do. You know, I could see him logging into a Fidelity account. Uh, yeah. I couldn't see him, you know, working with one of these USB devices. At least not yet. No, but if, no I have resistance to it. Right. I mean, I yeah. I purchased the the Nano S, the Ledger Nano S, and. I started the process and never completed the process years ago. And I just have this device. And now I purchased two new ones that are a bit easier to use and can store a lot more um, different uh, coins on them. Mm -hmm. The original one that I had was up to three, which 
not nearly enough for the kind of um, strange pepper shot um, kind of shotgun approach I have to <laughs> cryptocurrency investing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a techie. I have engineering and science degrees. Like what do you, uh, <laughs> of yeah. course your mom and dad aren't going to do it. If, if people like me are still having that kind of resistance. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking the, the, uh, on the cock punch purchase, it, it should be said that, um, you bought it on the secondary market even before the full original mint had had completed. So there were 5,555 unique cock punches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there were 300 or so left by the time that you were making your purchase on the secondary market. You were going through OpenSea, if I'm understanding that correctly. That's right. So someone had purchased, multiple people had had purchased them upon their first mint. They were on the allow list um, to buy it at 0.3 ETH. And they immediately were posting it on a marketplace for sale. And you were able to get it at around 1.3, 1.4, something like that. And from 0.3 to 1.2 is, is quadruple, right? Almost 1.5, it got up to. And then... Interestingly, if you look now, the floor price is 1.36. So it's actually gone down a little bit since I bought it. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, the timing on it's, it's really because interesting. Because more, yeah, more on the market. I think when you purchased it, there were 5% of all of them that had been minted up to that point were for sale and now it's 10%. So there's, mm -hmm. there's more on the market. It makes sense that it would dip just a tiny bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which is fun. I didn't get into it for the investment. I really like, right. I've been following Tim Ferriss for a long time and, and I'm really excited to see where the project goes. Um, but the I think the timeline that you started outline is is interesting insofar as I was not on the allow list. And so when I connected my wallet, uh, because I was not on the allow list and I was not on the wait list, it had a countdown timer saying, you know, two hours, you know, hour and 45 minutes, hour and 30. Like I was watching the counter time, uh, the counter timer count down. And as I was watching it count down, it had flipped from the allow list to the watch list. And like, they were just, they were selling out. Like it was, and that's the other crazy thing too, is when I started trying to buy before getting into all of this, you know, uh, trying to move ether around into my little sandbox account, uh, you know, there were, there were, uh, it went from. 5,555 available down to like 1,500 available within 30 minutes. I mean, just from the allow list. And then it started tapering off slower from there. And then by the time it hit the the waitlisted group, you know, it was down in the the hundreds. And then it sold out before the waitlisted group mm -hmm. uh, time bucket had completed. And so if you weren't on an allow list or waitlist, you didn't get one for 0.3 ETH. Yeah, I looked at the resale percentage to the artist. Mm-hmm the royalties essentially on, on secondary sales. And he had it at 6.9%. So mm. certainly not insignificant. It's higher than what a lot of artists have done mm -hmm. um, recently. Um, and also I know OpenSea was having, an, th there were some controversies that they weren't necessarily going to be enforcing their royalty payouts because it's, that's, that's not hard baked into um, the smart contract. It's baked into the uh, the the OpenSea contract, and OpenSea is the official official secondary market. And what that means is you can sell it outside of the the OpenSea market, um, but if you sell it within the OpenSea market, then the the artist, in this case Tim Ferriss's original wishes, will be honored as far as uh, royalty payout. And I would good hope that's baked into their. The open C smart contract version of it. So, and I just looked the total volume of cock punch transactions is uh, 2,837 ETH, which equates to $3.4 million. Okay. So, about 3.4 million of it, about $3.4 million worth of, of uh, cash dollars has changed hands over the course of. Right. The, and we, we calculated earlier that. At the 0.3 ETH price, it was a, just under two million. Yep. That that would go to um, 
Tim Ferriss's wallet that he set up for Cock Punch. That is actually all of those initial sales proceeds were going to the um, Saisei Foundation. Foundation, right? Yeah. And um, so that means if that's just under two million, it's another one point four million in transactions on the secondary market. Mm -hmm. So resales. Mm -hmm. And take six point nine percent of one point four million. What what is that? A hundred thousand? And that was going to go to Tim directly rather than yeah. the foundation. And as he said in his interviews, you know, that's how he's going to essentially get paid back for all the money he spent on all the development and the um, working with contract artists and all that kind of stuff for putting this project together. Yep. Yeah. Re repayment and also continued payment into the continued development that he's doing because he's continuing right. to to craft and so all of the cock punches right now look like a rotating fist with a blade and uh, the big reveal will be on friday so on friday there will be some form of of airdrop or update to, to show what you got what your attributes are what your cock looks like i think that's uh that's a long time to go to not look mm. in your pants <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um so I'm, this is I'm unique. I, I mean, maybe maybe other projects have done this, and I just you know they've been under my radar or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. not. I uh, you know I'm not looking at every uh, you know <laughs> NFT mint happening on a daily basis, but um, I have not read or heard about this style of oh you don't know what you're getting for mm -hmm. days after you've actually made the purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look back. I think I thought Grails. I think proof when they did grails and maybe even moonbirds was um, was similar. You didn't see what your grail was for until there was a reveal, so there was some kind of delay. Yeah. But I'll have to look into that. But yeah, it's a that's a really interesting it's a really interesting mechanic because it 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 means all of the aftermarket sales are purely based on speculation and interest in the project as a whole, mm -hmm. not the individual item and so i'll be right. curious to see how the uh how the resales change or how everything changes after friday when the when the cocks are revealed yeah i'm sure i'm sure there will be a pump and more sales will happen yeah yeah i imagine so so and you'll see a much wider I mean, probably over the next week, what you'll see is like right now, of course, everything is all about the same value because nobody knows that one is different from another. Mm -hmm. But as those attributes and the visuals are revealed, you're going to find that it, it would be interesting to see the time it would take to have those bin out into like a histogram of value for, you know, based on attributes and things mm -hmm. or clans, yeah. you know, whatever attributes there are, I'm sure. Um, he did have a new image that I hadn't seen before. You know, initially there was just the the really brawny uh, cock punch mm. um, was the only image that I had ever seen, uh, and there were a lot of close ups of aspects of it or whatever. But now on today on the mint the mint page that he had updated it with the a second image, mm. there was almost like looks like a wizard. Oh cock yeah, punch. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's neat to see that that uh, there's a different different aesthetic. Um, it's not all going to be similar shapes and sizes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And according to his, um, the the podcast that 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 I listened to that he was on the Bankless and the 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 Kevin Rose, I think he talked about this, especially in the the Bankless podcast. Um, the image that you have as your nft is is almost like one one sample or one rotating sample of a of a very detailed three-dimensional piece of art that was created and so each of the unique uh, cock punch nfts are going to have for the cock punch owners the ability to download these multi-gigabyte 3d rendering files of of the character and so this is not a you know, a, a 2D rendering of a, of a profile uh, image or an isometric view of a character. There is a full 
3D rendering of every aspect of the character uh, down to intricate detail of of accessories and um, styles and, and, and every aspect of the character. And so... That's really uh, cool. It would seem to me that unless the 3D environment it probably doesn't have this, but you know, if, the way that the images look, the, the few that he's put out there, um, there's a, um, a lighting schematic within the mm. environment that he, you know, initially took these, um, that he designed, but it would seem mm. to me with a 3D model, if you're being given the actual model, you'd be able to bring it into your own environment. Mm -hmm and light it however you saw fit or use lenses of different types because, you know, uh, long lenses, short lenses um, give a different perspective. It's like mm -hmm. I, right now I'm using a very wide lens in uh, my camera view. And so, you know, you get really close or whatever and it makes my mm -hmm. nose look super big and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a, a lens that um, kind of foreshortens, it really compresses an image um, would give you a completely different view like mm -hmm. you know uh, i think that that's pretty neat mm -hmm. novel yeah for sure yeah especially if you can directly import into blender or into unity or into unreal into any of these uh desktop editors of 3d 3d files yeah you can then tweak it and and do those sorts of manipulations as far as different lighting lighting filters um perspectives etc cetera, etc cetera. seems like it wouldn't be too big of a stretch to go from having that 3D file to being able to create a skin for your game that is mm -hmm. your cock punch. Yeah, that's right. Or to take the the model and to animate it, or to uh, uh, to to articulate. I mean, I don't know what what degree of of anchors are provided as far as skeletal, et cetera. But I imagine there's um, it, it creates the opportunity for digital artists that are familiar with 3D animation to uh, to take the the original piece and do various posings do various uh uh locomotions uh with uh yeah. with their cock they can locom I, locomote their cock <laughs> i would be it'll be interesting to see how much of that info is um handed over and how much of it is mm -hmm. held back in reserve mm -hmm. um yeah, sure. in those 3d models that he's providing because you know i i think he tim thinks that there is a lot of opportunity in this project where mm -hmm. it may blossom into all kinds of intellectual property. And I, he's probably right. So, you know, how much control does he want to have over, <laughs> over how this thing grows in the future? Yep. And that's part of the aesthetic in blockchain too. It's like, what, what do you hand over to the participants and collectors so that they will play in your, your world that you've mm -hmm. created um, to help it grow faster? Mm -hmm versus holding on to the keys to the kingdom so that nobody else can run away with with things that you know like a traditional company would want to make money from like disney mm -hmm. yeah. yep yeah and much of that uh in response to those types of questions uh tim's most common response is tbd to be determined yeah. so we'll see we'll see i'm excited to see i, I really i like him i like his work and he seems to be having a lot of fun with this. I'm excited to be along for the ride. Yeah, and I, I know that uh, he has his issues with, um, has had issues, well, probably still with depression and, and all kinds of, mm -hmm. um, you know, mental quality health. mental health and yeah. and the fact that he's just so energized and jazzed about this kind of thing and, and yeah. it's, it's making him have fun. Like he sounded happy on his interviews about mm -hmm. the project. Like I'm happy for him that, yeah. Yeah. that he's yeah. in that space. Here, here. Oh yeah, hit that subscribe button. It'll be like giving me a hug, and you'll get oxytocin too.